How you going, random stranger? Fate Zero, episodes five and six today. Last time we left off with Saber and Lancer just about to make a final standoff, but Ryder was like, not today, Satan, because he wants a proper grail war and he doesn't want potentially one of the strongest contenders to bow out so early. So first thing that comes to mind when I think back to the last episode was the incredible animation that was on display in that Saber Lancer fight scene. And a comment from Orange mentioned that exact same thing. So they wrote, the animation, even though it is so old, is excellent. The studio Euphotable is a bit like QINE in the way they work. Instead of mostly relying on contractors and hiring artists, they mostly work in-house. They have a great 3D team and are really good at integrating CGI into hand-drawn 2D animation. So that was news to me that Ufotable kind of works in a similar way to Kiwani, and I'm a massive fan of Kiwani, not just for the immersiveness and the quality of the animation, but also how well integrated all of that is with the story. So there's this virtuous cycle, I feel, where the story lends itself to great animation and then the animation significantly enhances the story. And I really, really felt that with that fight scene, uh, which we'll talk more about later in detail, but I wanted to rant about it up front because part of why I couldn't believe the episode was over so quickly was because the dialogue exchange between Saber and Lancer where they learned more about each other and was feeling out each other's strengths and weaknesses, that was all really spaced out and synced perfectly with the physical progression and the animation of the fight. So I thought that was just all done really, really well. But let's rewind a bit and talk about what's going on strategically with the different masters and the servants. So Tokiyomi and the church's plan to have Archer initiate the first conflict with Assassin was to draw out the other servants and I think they accomplished what they set out to do. It also opened up a way for Kirei to take refuge in the church so he can, much like his servant, gather information f- about the other Grail War participants and attack from the shadows. But Kirei, Kirei is still being a bit weird. I, I can't shake the feeling that he's hiding something from his dad, Rise, who seems to be quite confident that they have the grail in the bag, especially because they have this ongoing alliance with Tokiomi. But it was interesting when Rise was talking about how he can't wait for his old eyes to witness a miracle of the grail, meaning he's assuming that victory and the grail is as good as theirs. So while he was saying all of that, the shot was actually focused on Kirei's downturned face. Like he has something else entirely in mind for how this war is going to pan out. Or he's just still sort of open to other options other than helping out the church and Tokiyomi. It's really fun to be able to watch the different strategies of each of the masters unfold. We are still at that really early stage where observation is the main game. Like Ryder said, waiting is part of war. Uh, Kiritsugu is also enacting his own subterfuge by using Airi as a decoy master, which means he can observe and also act from the shadows more freely. It does seem that Saber was aware of the plan because last time I was like, oh, there's no way that she would have agreed to this. But Yeah, it does seem that she was in on it to use Ari as a decoy because in her confrontation with Lancer, she addresses Arisville as if she was her master. I I still can't imagine that she would have been very happy about this strategic decision, although I think she also clearly understood the the benefits it would afford them. Uh, We also met Maya. We know next to nothing about her other than that she seems to be fully devoted to Kiritsugu for whatever reason and seems to subscribe to his worldview and what he wants to achieve by winning the Grail. So together they figured out pretty quickly that Tokiyomi deliberately exposed Archer. Uh, They're just not sure why he would do that. And so they're going to keep eyes on Fuyuki Church even though it's against the rules. But, you know, at this point... Rules seems to be so secondary to guaranteeing victory for yourself. 
Interestingly, there was a really quick shift in Kiritsuka's strategy of taking out Kaneth during Lancer and Saber's fight as soon as he realizes that Assassin is still alive. Seeing Assassin let him know that Kirei is up to something and he decided to wait until he can figure out exactly what's going on, which I thought was really smart. Because had he taken out Kaneth right then and there, he would have let Assassin and then Kirei know well, they might have detected that Irisville potentially was not Saber's actual master, that there's someone else at play. We also learned from Irisville that Kiritsugu is supremely messed up. So the, the big question surrounding him is, why does happiness cause him pain? He clearly has a capacity to be happy, and I think he wants to be happy. For example, he loves Ilya and enjoys her existence. There was that touching scene where he was worried about her weight compared to his shotgun, but he doesn't allow himself these joys you get from human connection. Uh, Naisano actually also pointed out that during the kiss with Maya, his eyes are like wide open. So it's not like he allows that relationship to bring him any measure of peace either. I'm, I'm sticking to my theory that the burden of saving the world weighs so heavily on his mind that anything that deters him from that ultimate purpose is considered by him to be a kind of suffering, no matter how much he may want it. And coincidentally, this is crazy, but I just finished reading Jane Eyre and there is a character in there of all places, a character called Sinjin Rivers, who I think represents Kiritsugu's character archetype exactly. If you haven't read Jane Eyre, uh, Sinjin is a character that Jane, the main protagonist, almost marries, but largely doesn't because he's someone for whom ambition and principle erases any passion or personal connection that he might allow himself. His only goal is to become a missionary and spread Christianity to a fallen world, and he will sacrifice everything, so family ties, physical safety, and even a woman that he's madly in love with called Rosamond Oliver to achieve that. And there are actually, I put up some quotes describing Sinjin that I think word for word are applicable to Kiritsugu as well. I'm just going to read it out. Uh, here's one. The humanities and amenities of life had no attraction for him. Its peaceful enjoyments, no charm. Literally, he lived only to aspire after what was good and great, certainly, but still he would never rest, nor approve of others arresting around him. As I looked at his lofty forehead, still and pale as a white stone, at his fine lineaments fixed in study, I comprehended all at once that he would hardly make a good husband, that it would be a trying thing to be his wife. I understood, as by inspiration, the nature of his love for Miss Oliver. Maybe you can substitute that for either Irisville or Maya. I agreed with him that it was but a love of the senses. I comprehended how he should despise himself for the feverish influence it exercised over him, how he should wish to stifle and destroy it, how he should mistrust its ever conducting permanently to his happiness or hers. So I guess there's an explanation for why happiness causes Kiritsugu pain. It's because he sees and feels it as a barrier to his ambition. And he knows that it would never in the long term make himself or the person he loves happy, which is a pretty awful way to exist. Uh, there's a bit more to the quote. I saw he was of the material from which nature hews her heroes, Christian and pagan, her lawgivers, her statesmen, her conquerors, a steadfast bulwark for great interests to rest upon, but at the fireside, too often a cold, cumbrous column, gloomy and out of place. So basically just saying that he's born for and built for uh, achieving great global scale uh, accomplishments, but in terms of being someone you can relate to personally, he's just not that guy. Uh, also, one more quote here, which I think is maybe a good predictor of what might happen in Fate Zero. 
uh, the longer this war goes on. So he is a good and a great man, but he forgets pitilessly the feelings and claims of little people in pursuing his own large views. It is better, therefore, for the insignificant to keep out of his way, lest in his progress he should trample them down. Yeah, so quite a scary painting of Sinjin, and also I think Kiritsugu too, in that we, we already said that he will do whatever it takes to win the Grail War. Uh, at the end of the day, he's going to sacrifice whatever and whoever he has to to get done what he thinks needs getting done. And so I think by the end of this Fourth Grail War, Kiritsugu would have sacrificed potentially some of the people close to him to achieve victory. Uh Irisville is probably one of them that we know of, but I don't know, there's probably Maya potentially as well. So it's going to be sad. His story is definitely one of tragedy just unfolding, but tragedy in the service of a greater good. I find the master-servant relationship between Tokiyomi and Gilgamesh interesting. Tokiyomi feels like he's playing with fire and he knows it. In fact, he has to placate that fire and make sure he doesn't do anything to offend it, otherwise he's going to pay. For example, if the modern world turns out to be too boring for Gilgamesh, he's going to eviscerate Tokiomi. He'll be like, why did you waste my time and summon me, me here to this world? You're going to pay. Uh, I also like that Gilgamesh isn't fighting for any grand purpose. He really just wants shiny things and he's not so much into obtaining the grail for himself so much as not wanting anyone else to touch his toys. Uh, so on the grail and it granting a wish, presumably it grants one wish to one wish each to the master and the servant who wins, right? Yeah, that must be it because Otherwise, there would be major problems in terms of how divergent the goals are of some of the pairs of masters and servants. On the revelation of Archer being Gilgamesh, uh, I've read a little bit about the Epic of Gilgamesh, and I'm really curious to see if they bring the character of Enkidu into the picture. Enkidu, of course, was the totally platonic best mate of Gilgamesh whose death causes an identity crisis in Gilgamesh and prompts him to search for the meaning of life and contend with his own mortality. In fact, Enkidu's death, uh, as far as I know, spurred Gilgamesh's desire to achieve immortality through fame. And fame, of course, plays a critical role in which heroes the Grail summons uh, to serve in the war. Also... Archer's ability to like rain down a host of potentially legendary weapons seems to be quite OP to me. And I wonder if this seeming advantage is linked to the fact that he's manifested from the oldest myth out of all the other servants. Uh, Tokiomi called Gilgamesh the king of heroes, and I suppose that's referring to how because the other servants came after him chronologically, their legends would naturally uh, be in reference to his. However, even though the age of your legend might have some influence on like your relative ability as a servant, I do like that they make it a lot more complicated than that, in that there's a lot of other factors that can shift the balance uh, for example, which servant class you're summoned to, or your master's abilities, and also like the servant master dynamics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So yeah, there were some comments about what contributes to a servant's strength, which I found really, really fascinating, um, and kind of really helpful to wrap my mind around the possibilities. Uh, so from Medbred. As far as strength in age, things in fate get stronger the further back they've existed. Because the world used to exist in the age of gods, 
In this age, science didn't exist and humans relied heavily on divine beings. However, beginning with Mesopotamia, the first real civilization, humanity began to reject the gods, and the gods in turn left the humans in anger. Then magic began to slowly disappear little by little until it became a fraction of what it once was as seen in the modern age. Thus, a relic or hero from an older era would be stronger than one from recent history. I think it's so cool that they incorporated the relative influence or decline of the role of faith in society into the calculation of what makes a relic or a servant particularly powerful. Here's another comment from Major Lawliot. How it goes for the strengths of servants, it's a combination of factors. First and foremost, one, the power they had in life. Two, fame. Heroic spirits and by consequence servants are beings of history that are supported by that history. The grade of their fame directly boosts their power and depending how far that fame goes, it can give them greater access to things they had in life or outright powers and items and traits they never had due to close associations people have made. Alexander, for example, claims birthright from Zeus. Yeah, I thought, I actually really like that factor that the powers of a servant doesn't necessarily have to match up to historical accuracy. It's more the ideas that came to be attached to certain beings even after they had died. So I thought that was really cool. Uh, and three, class and exploits of a servant. If you have a servant that could wield swords and lances when he was alive really well, chances are he can be both saber and lancer. But what if his swordsmanship was much better? Uh, yeah, so really great details on what determines how strong a servant is, and it pretty much matches up to what I surmised from these first few episodes. Uh, I do appreciate, again, that it's a complex balance of several different sliding factors. Uh, I imagine the masters also muddy the waters quite a bit, including how they interact with their servants and the, I hate this word, but the, how much synergy they have with them. So based on just fame and epicness of legend, it would seem Archer, so Gilgamesh and Ryder, uh, Iskander or Alexander the Great, would be the key contenders. Uh, even above Saber, but the fact that Arturia was summoned in the Sabre class with Excalibur seems to massively shift that balance, as does the fact that Ryder's master is Waver, who is a relatively inexperienced mage who, and who probably can't provide as much mana support as someone like Kiritsugu or Tokiyomi. Also, for example, a master-servant relationship with chemistry that is just off the charts. And I'm thinking specifically of Kasta and Ryunosuke. Maybe that lends a surprising amount of advantage as well. I would say that Ryunosuke and Kasta are the most in tune with each other. I still don't know who Kasta is, but I guess he's somewhere from the medieval era based on that like one shot from the ED. So he'd be the weakest in terms of myth status, but his connection and his soulmateness with Ryunosuke might balance that out even more. Speaking of Ryunosuke, uh, thank you, Edda233, who very amusingly and in a way that makes total sense to me, described him as a muggle serial killer who was about as gifted in magic as Vernon Dursley. And the only reason that he was summoned by the Grail was because he very sloppily performed a summoning ritual, and that was that. To think that there is a full-on wild card in the form of Ryunosuke makes things interesting. He is definitely the underdog here, as is Kasta amongst the rest of the other servants, but maybe the two of them have some tricks up their sleeve, or maybe they're shared crazy yields some unexpected returns in the war and what would be really amusing is if so they're not actually setting out specifically to get the grail but because in the process of them carrying out their gleeful murder spree of young children they become a force to reckon with because they realize that the only way they will be allowed to continue this rampage 
is to eliminate all of the other masters and servants. And so their desperation or their bloodlust for little kids is what causes them to really up their game. So it's going to be super dark with those two, but I am curious to see how far they can go in this war. Another servant's identity we confirmed last time was Assassin, who is actually a manifestation of Hassan Isabar, a the founder of an 11th century order of assassins who operated as a sect of Shia Islam and who engaged in espionage and murdered some key Muslim and Christian leaders all throughout Persia and Syria for political reasons. And I loved learning about that because I realized also that Hassan and his Hashashins were the original inspiration for Assassin's Creed, uh, which I love. And also our use of the word assassination is derived from those guys. So lots of interesting facts there. Uh, A comment from Mikhail Fendi about the way assassin manifests itself. Uh, Hassan itself is something like a title that was given to many people as the head of the assassination organization. This particular Hassan in Fate Zero is called Hassan of a Hundred Faces. There should be about 18 heads, including him. There is one called Hassan of Serenity, Hassan of Cursed Arm, etc., each with a particular special ability. Yes, I just knowing that there's like, you know, 100 of them and then 18 leaders makes Assassin uh, a much more formidable opponent than at first glance. Uh, Also from NRVNQSR, in life, their trait was a severe multiple personalities disorder that in their time wasn't seen as an illness, but as a rare skill of being able to switch personalities, extremely useful for Assassin work, of course, which in their heroic spirit form manifests as a literal legion of 100 Assassins, as you've seen. Yes, very cool to know that that is the reasoning behind why Assassin can manifest themselves as separate entities. Uh, I mean, it's not cool that a legit mental disorder such as multiple personalities disorder was not recognized back in the day, but as a narrative ploy, I think it's clever. So it seems the church's and Kide's plan is for the remaining assassins to sneak up on all the masters who have assumed that assassin is dead and therefore that that Kide or whoever his master was is out of the game. I think they're also playing into this underestimation of assassin's ability and importance. Uh, interestingly, you know, also the historical assassin under Hassan, so back in the 11th century, apparently only ever carried out assassinations using daggers. So never poison or arrows from afar. So I do wonder if that's going to hold true in Fate Zero too. Something that's been entertaining to watch is seeing how the different servants interact with the modern world. For Gilgamesh, the modern world is unspeakably ugly in his words, but he's willing to endure it as long as there are treasures that he can collect. Saber seems kind of neutral. She's not overly impressed with airplanes and technology like that, but maybe that has something to do with how servants are given this mental download of knowledge about the modern world just enough for them to get by Ryder though he seems to be the most excited about this world especially modern weaponry because he is already planning how things like bomber planes would help him achieve his plan for world domination curiously He also manifests his physical form all the time as a choice. So he really seems to like being in this world. Uh, Related to that, the idea of ancient rulers and conquerors having access to today's weapons is both fascinating and also a terrifying thought. Since their times, you know, well, really only in the last one or two centuries, There have been rules of war that have been developed. Um, These have been broken numerous times, of course, in modern history. But over time, they have solidified into universally accepted modern norms. For example, this understanding that civilians should not be mass targeted. 
And if you do commit war crimes, you are generally censured or there are sanctions that apply to you or your own population will turn against you. Whereas back in the day, all that stuff was par for the course. You could plunder as you want and commit mass murder of civilians without having to manage the public relations around all that. Also, there weren't weapons of mass destruction available to them, obviously. Neither did mass armies exist. I mean, Alexander the Great's army probably had a maximum of 50,000 men, you know, and even less so for King Arthur. So interesting thought exercise there as to how ancient rulers would or wouldn't exercise restraint if given modern weapons of destruction. Although given the kinds of people that are in power today, I don't know, it just makes me think that it is a huge miracle that we haven't all been wiped off the face of the earth. Yeah, well, that turned pretty dark really quick. Some notes about Iskandar, he has a very set idea of what constitutes an honorable war. And I guess you could interchange honorable with like fun or meaningful. He's very dismissive of assassin in particular and kind of scoffs at how they fight this war by skulking in the shadows all the time. Like Saber, he prefers head-on fights and wants to get some good battles out of this while being very confident about his ability to challenge the best. It is kind of admirable, his hedonism, like food, sex, sleep, and war. That is all you need for the best life ever. And he says something I try to live by. I don't know how much I succeed at it, but he says, whatever you do, enjoy it to the fullest. And he's laughing all the time, like that big belly laugh of his. He's fast becoming one of my favorite servants um, after Saber, of course. Uh, Also, Iskandar's title, the King of Conquerors, really fits him too, because out of all the servants, he did actually conquer whole nations in his time. I mean, King Arthur, for example, only really defended Britain from invaders for a time. So it's unsurprising then, you know, when I read a bit more about Alexander the Great, that he was, if not the first human to self-deify themselves, at least one of the most prominent human rulers who fashioned themselves as a god. And it really set the example for rulers who came after Alexander the Great, especially the Roman emperors like Julius Caesar and Augustus and Caligula, who looked back in history and found Alexander the Great as someone to emulate. So much so, uh, fascinatingly, that they that visiting Alexander the Great's tomb became sort of a thing, the fashionable thing for Roman emperors to do. The relationship between Irisville and Saber, also fascinating. Saber is confident, especially when she goes on about how she's able to command different vehicles, even in the modern world. But because of speech differences, or maybe it's just her character being surprisingly say-so, her phrasing of that has Irisville giggling over the unintended double entendre. It's also so cute how Saber has trouble interpreting what it means when Irisville is laughing at her. So she's kind of like this adorable blockhead and I really love the interactions with each other. Uh, For whatever reason, Saber can't take spirit form. Uh, So unlike Ryder, who chooses to be in physical form, she doesn't actually have a choice. And I'm not sure why. I don't know if I missed some piece of information from before, but... In any case, Irisville loves it because it means that she can dress Saber however she wants, and Saber actually submits to that. Maybe she doesn't really care what kind of clothes she wears, or it's more a show of chivalry and deference to Irisville. Uh, Certainly a deference I think she finds much harder to show Kiritsugu because of their difference in worldview. Even just the way that Kiritsugu speaks to Saber or of her, like when he's watching her fight Lancer, he says, let's see what you're capable of, my kawaii king of knights. It's not really a way to address someone you consider an equal partner in purpose and in mind. It's also kind of slightly a bit patronizing, but maybe that's just because he hasn't really seen what Saber can do yet and that'll evolve down the track the longer they partner together in this war. Or maybe, 
he'll forever see her as this little girl who was forced into the role of king, which is so contradictory to what Saber is capable of as a powerful servant. But in the meantime, uh, Irisville is just being a good intermediary between the two of them. Uh, Iris is also all about enjoying the time that she has left. Uh, It's the first time that she's out in the real world and she really doesn't have long before she has to do whatever it is that she was created to do in this war. And I found it sweet that Saber understood that, even though she is worried about exposing Irisville to danger. On another level, Arturia, I think, understands more than most what it feels like to have a single purpose forced onto you and needing to fulfill a role that doesn't really allow for even thinking about things like fun and joy. And so Saber and Iris will sort of share that pain together. Uh, and Iris will sees that in Saber that her role as king meant she didn't really have the luxury of enjoying the finer things in life, just as Irisville spent her whole life, you know, created as a homunculus, not for any particular fun reason, but because, you know, f- for whatever she has to do in this war, which I'm dying to get to know, but it's probably going to be something that we find out right in the last episode. Um, yeah, so all of that understanding and the soft moments between them really makes them so enjoyable to watch. The way that Saber calls Arasul Hime and then watches her dance in the ocean, just how they support and trust each other in that fight against Lancer. So they are a rare spot of sunshine in this show and I'm just going to take what I can get. Which leads us to the recap of the fight between Saber and Lancer. First of all, Lancer's identity, uh, first of the Knights of Fianna, Diarmuid of the Love Spot. Uh, who, I did look him up, is a demigod from Irish folklore tradition, infamous for defeating thousands of warriors single-handedly, but also for his beauty spot that I think only works on women, which I found hilarious uh, because what a stroke of luck, seeing as Saber happens to be the only female identifying servant, but also because she is in the Saber class, she is resistant to his magic. So unless there's like a female identifying assassin amongst the Legion, I think the beauty spot's pretty useless, at least in this war. Um, I like Lancer. He still embodies some of the stuffy attitudes of his time, but he's not misogynistic about it. Uh, He compliments Saber for not sweating while fighting, which is impressive for a woman. (laughs) And he has a level of true respect for her, especially as they are two of the very few servants who would prefer to fight in the open. And they also share in this same honor code for knights. It bothers Lancer, for example, that they can't reveal their names first before they fight. And he and Saber have a mutual understanding of wanting it to be a fair fight. Unfortunately, Lancer is also the servant of Caneth, who interrupts Lancer paying his respects to Saber by saying like something like, hurry up and finish the job, asshole. So yeah, that moment where Lancer is, you know, saying how honored he is to be able to even exchange blows with the King of Knights, totally ruined by Caneth, who has no time for that bullshit. <laughs> Thinking about the comparative advantages and disadvantages of Lancer versus Saber, uh, combat skills wise, they seemed in that fight to be quite equally matched. Uh, Actually, I would have expected Saber to be more obviously superior skills-wise, given just how much hype surrounds a servant in the Saber class wielding Excalibur, and also comments like Saber's parameters are A or higher, and also she is the far bigger threat than Lancer. I think it was Tokiomi or was it Kide who said that? One of them. But then I guess the fight wouldn't have been as epic if they weren't so equally matched. So maybe they were on more equal footing for plot reasons. Whatever the case, I mean, I think what was surprising was that it seemed Lancer had the upper hand when it came to strategic thinking. And a large part of that was because he dual wields and Saber had to reckon with the uncertainty of which spear he would use. 
as well as not knowing his name because if she'd known then she would have been able to account for like the spear's magical abilities so the fact that uh gay dark i think the red spear could chip away at the wind mana saber was using to hide excalibur seems to greatly negate the advantage of wielding excalibur also saber seems to make a rather critical mistake by assuming that Lance's noble phantasm has to be either one of the two spears, when in reality they both are, or rather his noble phantasm seems to be his method of wielding the two enchanted weapons in tandem with each other. Like, she didn't seem to know genuinely, like Ryder did, that a noble phantasm is not necessarily just the one attack or the one weapon, but it can be an ability or more interestingly a method of attack uh so the part where lancer started attacking for real using the red spear was fantastic you know the blows that like came one after the other and just saber being surprised at the invisible air being chipped away i also loved the narrative choice to have the audience be able to listen in on the servants as they strategize and and try to get the upper hand so i think had Ryder not intervened Saber was in some pretty deep shit. You know, she was still very confident in her ability to one-shot Lancer, even without the use of her injured arm, because by then she knew his identity and his noble phantasm, or maybe it's just part of her training as a knight, you know, to be stoic about facing death to the very end. Still, I mean, I think Saber was in a pretty precarious situation there. Also, by the way, their faces at the end, when Ryder charges in, those were priceless. There's an interesting theme emerging around those who prefer to fight out in the open and in the light, honorably, face to face, versus those who take advantage of the shadows and strike undercover. And those in the light are a distinct minority. I think it's really only Saber, Lancer, and Ryder who care about the method in which this war is fought. Uh, they don't want to do it the lowbrow way and pure victory, you know, victory at whatever cost is not really their style. Whereas Saber and Lance are subscribed to a knight's code and a chivalric deference to honor. Ryder wants value for his money. You know, if he's going to fight this war, he wants the full experience and a chance to fight with heroes from all different historical periods, preferably all at the same time, like a big old pub fight. He actually had hoped that more servants had answered Lance's challenge. Also, I think Ryder comes at this war from a noble conqueror's perspective, as shown by his teaching waiver that true conquest is to win, but not to destroy and to subjugate, but not humiliate. Uh, Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh, he seems the type to just prefer throwing weapons from a distance and overwhelm his enemies by sheer force, instead of engaging in something so pedestrian as hand-to-hand -hand combat. And if he does turn out to be like that, that would be an interesting twist to his legend. Uh, I mean, it's still early, but the Gilgamesh in Fate Zero seems to differ from the Gilgamesh of the legend, where there's all these stories of him defeating enemies and wild animals in close-up battles. Or maybe it's the result of Gilgamesh being summoned in the Archer class. So in relation to other servants, he might be weaker at close-up combat. Uh, so he's more for like ranged weaponry. But yeah, he's definitely compensated just by the sheer number of weapons he has to throw at them. Uh, masters, I don't think any of the masters are in the let's fight honorably camp, except maybe for Kadia. I don't know. Uh, I'm actually interested to see how he works with Berserker, which we've not seen yet. Not really, uh, because it doesn't sound like you can work with a Berserker servant so much as try and control them and direct their chaotic energy uh especially with what waver said about berserkers he basically said all they do is break things all right no watcher chat let's jump right into episode five a wicked beast's roar hmm no idea who that might be referring to i have a feeling it's not the 
ox that Ryder rides in on. But we'll see. Okay, if you guys are good, let's do this in three, two, one, play. I think Sabre is going to be super pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> More shocked faces. <laughs> that head flick of his is incredibly powerful. Contender for his noble phantasm, that head flick. I mean, that's one strategy, right? Form alliances, pledge your allegiance. He is talking to two knights with a lot of pride. <laughs> Just picking some earwax out. Don't eat it. Oh, I mean, oh. <laughs> technically the territories that Alexander conquered was way more than what Arthur was defending. <laughs> Waver is just at a loss. I feel so bad for him, but also Iskander is one of the coolest servants to have summoned. So, you know, he got out good uh yeah i mean it was interesting that saber recognized that iskander was a great king probably also knows that if you count by army size by territory conquered iskander does have an advantage over her but she is still not willing to back down i mean she also has a lot of reasons to be proud of who she is and what she accomplished during her lifetime it's interesting that saber seems to have regrets over how she conducted her rule largely because arthur did lose Britain eventually to the Saxons, but King Alexander, I don't think he would have too many regrets other than not conquering the whole entire world. Is that Saber's noble phantasm? That huge stream of light. Oh, I can't wait to see that. Wave is just like a little baby. The moron. Is that Canis? Oh boy. Ugh, his voice is so patronizing and slimy. Ugh, that sounds so dodd. Oh man, poor guy. His hand is so huge. Oh, 
Oh, he's gonna say he much rather's Waver being his master. Oh, he's right though. At least Waver is right there next to him. Oh, he got to him. Nice one, Iskander. It's interesting that the servants can uh, sense other servants. So that's assassin. <laughs> Big ups. Is Berserker here as well somehow? <laughs> I love how he puts his whole soul into every single sentence he says. Yeah, they're waiting for Lance or, or Saber, either one, to get illuminated. Hello, Gilgamesh. <laughs> Clash of Kings. The true OG. By timeline, like chronologically, he's right. But that doesn't really mean anything. Wait, so did Iskander actually announce his own name? I thought that was against the rules. Yeah, he did. <laughs> Naruhodo. <gasps> oh, Saber, just protecting Arasville. Whoa, look at that crazed look. <gasps> They're all here. Hey, he was taking the form of a knight. Like, he had the full knight's armor on. Are they going to band together, these three? I hope so. Even if it was a temporary alliance between Iskander, Saber, and Lancer. Can he? It's like shrouded in shadow. That's what Berserker is, right? It's unreadable. It's pure chaos. It's the crest worms, those bloody worms. It's like black magic, isn't it? No sane master. <laughs> it's always labeling the other servants like worms, dogs. Even Saber is shook by the power of his noble phantasm. Hmm. Max stealth. Oh. Damn. 
Damn, I wonder which knight he is. Does he, does Archer lose the weapons that he throws? Like, or do they just, is it like an infinite supply? Or maybe he just has enough weapons <laughs> to last for an eternity. Oh my gosh, we're getting another epic fight. Oh, nice. Man, and they're not just weapons being thrown, they're like explosives being thrown. Oh, this music is insanity. Well, I mean, Archer finally had to make a move. He's actually on the ground now instead of floating above in the sky. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Yo, Archer, he's got some pride the gates of babylon he's kind of not yeah being strategic if you mess with his pride everything goes out the door all rational or strategic thought oh my gosh he actually is forcing tokiyomi to use a seal Man, that's got to be so difficult for the servants. <laughs> Wait. What's happening? Oh my god. Wait, he's specifically going for Saber. What is that weapon? It's like this massive pole. Oh! So he's like a shadow version of Excalibur? No. What is that? Oh shit. <gasps> Lancer. Oh. Man, once I get like, first, I feel like Saber keeps getting saved in these early episodes. It was Ryder and now Lance is stepping in. Yeah. Oh man. Oh no. This is this is this is not good. Wait, maybe Berserker's gonna <laughs> flip. 
he's trying to resist. Oh, it must be awful being able to not be in control of your own body. Come on, Kiritsugu. Kiritsugu's got to do something, right? Ari, what are you going to do? Oh god. This is not going to work, surely. Wait, what's Ryder doing? <gasps> okay, thank you, Ryder. <laughs> He's got a clear shot. There you go. <laughs> You're gonna pick Saber up? Let's go for a ride. Oh damn, we got him. Just road raged him. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, He's not a knight per se, but he also shares the same honor code. I really love that. <laughs> I like that they show the mouth of Canis. Just to show that, you know, something someone said to him really got to him. <laughs> oh man, I like this. It's not an alliance technically, but it's an understanding. It's a mutual code. Just acting on impulse, really. Uh. <laughs> you know, got any flowers to give her? If not, we'll go now. Oh my god. Just like a little ragdoll. Oh, they shared a smile. Interesting they give precedence to, because it was Saber and Lance who fought first, like, Ryder's like, okay, just finish that business off first. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> That's my background screenshot. And they still managed to keep the cover of Ari being her master too. Yeah, I didn't really get how it worked that when Berserker grabs, anything Berserker grabs becomes their noble phantasm. I'll have to go back to that part. Okay, I feel like Kadia's mind. Oh no! Oh my god. Y 
Yeah, okay. It is all about being able to handle Berserker and direct him where you want him to, otherwise he'll just do his own thing. <sighs> We're not done with worms yet, are we? Oh, she found her Maya. Something use magic to monitor. Oh, <laughs> that's like an old school surveillance device attached to an animal. <laughs> oh no, what have they done? Look at all those blood smears. Big guy. Oh god. <gasps> what? Wait a s what? <laughs> it Hold up. He thinks Saber is the reincarnation of someone that he knew. A virgin forsaken by God. But, okay, so he clearly has Arturia confused for someone else because King Arthur was obviously not a virgin <laughs> forsaken by God. Oh, um, okay. That's so annoying. I feel like... Okay, wait. So those are bishops, yeah? So definitely sometime in the maybe 1500s, 1600s, maybe even 1400s. But uh, hopefully we'll get more clues in the next episode because it's really annoying me. <laughs> That's These are beautiful shots, by the way. Even though they're still shots, there's so much detail. I wonder if we'll ever, uh, if Mordred appears somehow. Oh, okay. Oh, man. All right, straight to episode six. Oh, uh, man, the masters are really getting into it now. And also, we've got a couple of tantalizing clues as to who Bluebeard might be. But for some odd reason, it has something to do with Saber. And I have no idea why. So uh, hopefully we'll get the answers in this episode. If you guys are good, let's sync this in three, two, one, play. Also, Cardia, man, I feel like his mind is just slowly slipping away, but he has managed to keep his promise to Sakura intact. Like, that's the only thing that's grounding him right now. <gasps> Iris feel <laughs> sweat on Saber's face. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> the toys oh my gosh it feels like she's getting out all of her teenage rebellion just out of her system in one go that is so incredibly fast 
They're not going to die because of the war. They're going to die because of Aris feels driving. <laughs> She's so badass. Yes, all in service of the war. Saber appreciates it. Oh no, here we go. Those bug eyes, man. I really don't know what his deal is. He is obsessed with Arturia for some reason. It's almost some kind of, yeah, obsessive worship of her. Is this some weird psychopath thing where they have a type of victim, right? And does Saber, like her appearance, maybe it's her blonde hair or something, I don't know. It triggers his fetish? Ugh. But Saber can handle him, right? Yeah, it was also really interesting that uh, Berserker, when Cardia lost control of him, he just totally switched his attention to Arturia. It seems like the crazies sort of are really attracted to Arturia for some reason. It's so tantalizing though because it has something to do with their historical connections. Man, poor Cardia. Is this going to be a fight? I feel like Saber would totally destroy Caster in a fight though. Ari, what are you doing out of the car? They look so good together. <laughs> Knows her. Oh my god! <laughs> I know him! Oh my god, he thinks she's Joan of Arc. Oh shit! <laughs> Seriously, it was just like a zap of lightning. Is she today? Oh shit. Oh my god, I should have met, I should have known. Uther Pendragon. I see, because he gave her his name. She gave her his. Oh, this is, this is, just took an interesting turn. So he literally sees her as his soulmate, or like his companion. He's like, let's conquer the world together again. What? Literally just because of her physical appearance, like her blonde hair and her stature. She's like, get out of my way. It's first warning. <gasps> I love her voice when she gets like when she gives orders. <laughs> oh man, I I mean what other serial child murderer is more famous than Jidere? And I just didn't even as soon as he was like Joan of Arc or Jean d'Arc, I was like, damn it. His type infuriating. Talks too much. Mansplaining. <laughs> it 
Is it Saber driving or is it Aris fuel? Oh man. So now they know who she is, her identity. It all makes so much sense now. Oh no, dang. Just did the watermelon head. Just smashed it like a watermelon. It's so hard to watch these two, but also... Oh, I thought that's basically what they were doing anyway. <laughs> this is supremely messed up. He has this idea that the more children he kills, the more it's a call to God to restore his maiden to him. <sighs> Kenneth, you little rat. <laughs> It's not his fault though. And he's still kneeling. Is Kaneth making him kneel? Solo me. Just told him. Yes, what is Saber going to do about that wound? Oh, what about the sheath? Like, Excalibur's sheath? Who <laughs> is she? That is wife? Daughter? Mistress? <gasps> Cheetah? So it's got it's like surplus of mana supply. It must be killing him to have these two masters. She is clearly obsessed with Lancer. Again, just a messed up three-way relationship. Oh, it's... <laughs> I see. That's right, his mole works on any woman except Saber. Who's doing that? Is that Kiritsugu? Hmm.
okay. Yes, I forget that there's actually real people who are impacted by this war. Like, unexplained explosions. Murderous. Resurrected spirits. Why would you trust this random, though? <laughs> Do your job, man, public officer. Well, the plot has to move on, so <laughs> just no suspicion whatsoever. Explode. <gasps> the whole building! Oh my god. I mean, <laughs> not subtle at all. <sighs> he found a way to survive. He feels bad. At least he evacuated everyone. <laughs> Took you me. Oh. What's he doing there? She's dead. She can't. She, how is she going to face off against Kire and Assassin? Oh, this is going to be slow torture, isn't it? He needs to bait Kiritsuku out. <laughs> Wolverine. All this baiting, trying to force people into acting. Do they even care that that happens? I don't know if that warrants a priority though, like... Yes, exactly. They are vest- the other mages are vested in keeping this war secret though, right? As much as possible. There's no why, it just happened. It's so ironic that they are still talking about keeping the rules when they themselves have broken so many. It's like the height of hypocrisy. About an archer. 
cast it should be minor rule changes. Oh, a temporary alliance. Like a truce until caster is taken off the board. Oh, these two. An interaction between these two is interesting. They're both bored. <laughs> wow, he's <laughs> it's on a binge. <laughs> yes, talking about rules and upholding the mage code of honor. Vortex of the root. Okay, so it sounds like some kind of enlightenment. Those of us who are only interested in the world. I see. Okay, that's interesting. They're more like the hedonistic, you know, bunch. Where you should just enjoy what you have in front of you. Hmm. Ultra right wing. I don't know if that means what we mean by it. <laughs> yes, then what is Kid A interested in? Doesn't seem like he's interested in the root either, not like Tokiyomi is. Or the Grail, or the pleasures of this world like Gilgamesh, so he's sort of a bit of a nowhere man. No, not really. <laughs> I mean, think of Rianosuke. Okay, he sounds genuine in his scorning of pleasures and joy. Is Gilgamesh seriously going to act as... <laughs> Kira is mental. It's gonna... Oh! <laughs> I could ship this. It's eminently shippable. Hmm, it's like within you. You just have to discover it, bring it out. Forgets who he is. <laughs> that is such a weird shot. Why? <laughs> Why the groin shot when he's literally talking about, I'll teach you. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. 
at once. Mm. Yep. I think he just likes the intrigue and the game. Yeah. He's a people watcher. I mean, what else are you going to do in this world? <laughs> because Takayomi is such like a bland piece of wood. And he's given something for Kid A to do. Just something to work towards. Interesting. I mean, servants don't actually have to subsist on food and drinks, right? So can they actually enjoy or feel pleasure in drinking? Otherwise, why would Gilgamesh do it? Kiritsugu? <laughs> oh man, I feel like these two episodes massively ramped up the interweb of relationships between the masters. My favorite unexpected interactions, definitely that last part with Kire and Archer. Oh... And also just Kire realizing that if he studies Kiritsugu and tries to figure out why he has such a single-minded focus on doing what he's doing, that he can somehow learn something about himself. So it's more for Kire, it's more of self-discovery more than anything else. And that's the thing that he needs as opposed to any external purpose outside of him. Whereas I feel like with Kiritsugu, he's just totally focused on achieving something that's outside of his own, own self. He's probably given up on himself at this point, really. He's kind of dead inside, you know? And the only thing that will give him meaning is if he manages to win this Grail War and use it to save the world or end the endless cycle of war. Whatever he is setting out to do. <gasps> Oh, man. Okay, guys, quick fire round of initial thoughts because I do have to jet off soon. Uh, our latest identity reveal, Bluebeard, who is actually Gilles de Rey, one of the generals who fought alongside Joan of Arc and who also turned out to be a psychopathic serial child abuser and murderer who was only caught after some sources say hundreds of kids had been abducted and killed. And I'd wish I'd figured it out before he revealed his name. I should have because I've known about this guy because the story is so horrific and because it's so oddly adjacent to someone like Joan of Arc who was known for her devotion to God. Uh, but yeah, he can't get all of them. The way that they revealed his identity too, on top of his name, making it so that he mistakes Arturia for Joan of Arc because of how she looks and his refusal to believe that she is genuinely King Arthur uh, leads him, well, adds fire to his motivation to now kill as many children as possible as some kind of sick sacrifice to God in order to, I don't know, force God to restore his maiden of his dreams to him. Uh, oddly enough, it's the most twisted motivation for a servant, but also kind of the purest motivation. It has nothing to do with winning the grail. And Ryunosuke obviously is fine to go along with it because murdering is right up his alley. So I'm curious to see if the other masters really do cooperate to eliminate Caster first before going on with the war themselves. I don't know if the church, you know, as the rule setter and the neutral observer will be able to pull that temporary alliance off. Um, certainly not with Katia, right? I don't know. Speaking of Katia, Katia is giving me sad vibes, man. He's 
in this battle against time because it seems like the crest worms are continuing to eat him from the inside out and on top of that he has to deal with berserker who is more than capable we see of snapping whatever magical leash Kadia manages to put on him and i noted it before but i wonder why berserker seems to have again an obsession with taking down saber we know why caster is obsessed but with berserker the only clue really is his appearance as a knight. So I think we can assume he's one of the knights who knew Arturia and who had beef with her. Uh, and that would probably most likely be Lancelot. So Lancer wasn't Lancelot, but I wonder if this knight is Lancelot, if Berserker actually is. Because his love for Guinevere not only caused this massive rift amongst the knights of the round table, but also eventually led Lancelot to betray Arthur and set up his own court over in France. So, yeah, I don't know. I feel like because of the shadow, because of the way that he was summoned, he can't, I don't think he's actually capable of speech or maybe he has been reduced right down to this desire for revenge against Arthur, maybe. Uh, the thing that kills me about Cardia though, is how he's still doing everything he's doing to save Sakura. And I don't know how long he's going to be able to hold on to that before he goes completely mad. Let's talk about that fascinating conversation between Kiritsugu and, not Kiritsugu, Kirei and Gilgamesh. So the two of them seem way more in sync with each other than Gilgamesh and Tokiyomi. They speak to each other far more like equals or not friends, you can't really use that term with them, but, uh, you know, strangers on a similar road or intrigued enough about each other to sit down and have a conversation lasting more than five minutes. They both struggle with the boredom that this world and this life brings them. Gilgamesh amuses himself by peeking into or getting to the heart of what the other masters and the servants want and watching them kind of like a kid watches some fish in a tank it's this detached observation from a position of self-identified superiority that makes Gilgamesh really interesting I think he finds Kirei intriguing because of his supposed lack of desire for anything unlike all the other masters and servants in the game or unlike any human really so his little side project for Kirei for him to discover the motivations of the masters both satisfies Gilgamesh's need for some amusement during this time and also Gilgamesh is betting that it will help Kirei discover for himself that he actually already has a, a capacity within him to feel joy and desire. He only has to go on this journey of enlightenment to reveal it to himself. So it's both a fun kind of distraction for Gilgamesh, but for Kirei, he really is thinking seriously about what he might find on as he goes about this little project, especially in relation to finding out what drives Kiritsugu. So yeah, I found just there were some sparks there, like some vague attraction between those two that makes their interactions very interesting. The last thing I'll say is in regards to Saber, just like a weird feeling. I get that Saber should be a lot better at fighting than she seems to be so far. Uh, we really haven't seen her gain the upper hand in any of the initial fights that we've seen her in and also she's had to have other servants step in to ensure her continued survival so i'm gonna be waiting for that moment where it just clicks that yes saber is actually one of the top contenders of this war because so far it hasn't really proven to be true that's it guys i hope you enjoyed those episodes i love that things are really getting heated up now and i feel like the intensity of fade zero is only going to go up with these next few episodes so until we meet again next time i will try to not take so long in between reactions uh, because yeah i did have to cut short this last bit where i sort of talk about my feelings about what just happened so hopefully i will see you guys all really soon and until then take care